For the past 15 years, the Friends of the Bennington Monument have been sponsoring a 5K race. Um, we pick out a shirt every year and change the color, and we have the sponsors are all listed on the back. Now, we use this money for whatever the state doesn't deem necessary to spend. So we have a, a group comes from Michigan once a year, and uh, they, it's a high school band. They, they play a concert at the, mu at the monument, and uh, we use the money to feed them. We also this year sponsored a drum and fife and drum corps from Connecticut, which they originated back when the Battle of Bennington actually took place. And they came this year, and we sponsored them, and they gave a concert. We also have uh, reenactors to come and set up their tents and talk to people and tell them what it was like. We have a cannon that we shoot off to start the race, and then we have small children walking or running around the circle of the monument that same day. Choosing the, the color for these shirts every year is fun because, of course, the men have one idea and the ladies have some another idea. But we've, we've chosen different colors over the years and we hang them on a clothesline so everybody can see what we've done in the past. We are running from my brother, Bruce Keene, who coincidentally was born on Battle of Bennington Day, August 16th. Um, he passed away two years ago from brain cancer, and these are all the cousins from all over the country running in his honor. We're uh, Bruce's, uh, his wife, and our two children. We're here to uh, run the 5K in his memory. It'll be wonderful. We're very happy that everybody in his family has come to join us. Yep, and yesterday was the, his 60th birthday yep. on Bennington Battle Day. He was born on Bennington Battle Day. Yep. This is Bruce's mom. The Bennington Monument is one of 12 historic sites that is run by the state of, the, of Vermont. So Bennington is very lucky to have this one in our town, which has over 30,000 visitors a year. The monument is open from May 1st to October 31st, and there is an elevator that takes you clear to the top. look at most of your soldiers life in the 18th century it's a lot of downtime and you know they used to say idleness is an idle mind is the devil's play toy so if they weren't out on details or guard duties or something like that they'd be sitting under their little makeshift hovels you know because very few people actually had tents and they'd be sewing and repairing their gears fixing their uniforms cleaning their muskets um, any sort of thing like that to keep maintain what we would t in today's world call combat readiness. Um, 
they'd be rolling musket rounds if they happen to have any powder. You'd have people cooking, um, which unfortunately we can't do here. Um, it, it was all about trying to stay busy and pass the time. You're miles away from home, miles away from your loved ones in a country you don't know. And, you know, you sit there and start thinking about home and stuff, which guys did. And they did write letters, although you have to remember most of your 18th century enlisted personnel were illiterate. Um, and most of their wives and sweethearts traveled with them. They were actually in the British Army kept on rosters just like the men were. And they got ration allowances and all sorts of things. It, um, but yeah, just sitting here doing mindless things like that. They'd have, you know, various games that they could play. Um, you didn't see a lot of them playing cards because gambling was illegal in the, in, in the American Army. You could be flogged for that. Um, and if you think about Stark's men who came over from New Hampshire, they're... All these guys, long way from home, didn't know necessarily where they were, and they're covering good ground. They're covering good amounts of ground every day. And they, um, they didn't have the benefit of being able to set up a full camp every night. They'd roll, most of the time, they'd roll up in their blanket if they were lucky enough to have one, and sleep under the stars, and then get up the next morning and get moving again. Um, so yeah, you know, if you're looking for authentic, interpretive camp life, this is it. You'd have guys napping, you know, and never, never lay down when you can sleep type of thing. Um, but yeah, they'd be repairing their, they'd be repairing their gear, fixing their uniform coats, any of that stuff. Like I said, I happen to be making a knapsack at the moment. You know, it's one of those. I happen to have stumbled across some canvas. You know, some canvas material, and you know, I got an 18th century sewing kit, minus the inauthentic pieces. Um, this is all hand sewn. It took me about two weeks to make this. Just random pieces of material I had laying around. Um, so, you know, you got that, and you just sit down and start working. And you'll be amazed at how much you can get done. So I would represent um, a grenadier unit that was here with uh, General Burgoyne, uh, Regiment Specht, a German grenadier unit. Uh, basically came over from Germany, it was almost a, a full two month journey on, on, on the water, uh, landed in Quebec, um, basically uh, wintered there, learning some of the tactics of the American foe. And then uh, in, in 1770, uh, 1770, 1777, uh, took the trip down and, and fought at a place like Ticonderoga, Fort Anne, Hubberton, uh, here in Bennington. And uh, as I tell everybody, those of us who didn't get killed here pretty much were, were killed at uh, Saratoga in October. Those who survived uh, were either put on prison barges or scattered throughout the colonies. Um, how to, how to uh, actually construct their own shelters. Uh, they were given very little by the Americans, and you can understand why. Um, and others um, actually enjoyed, enjoyed the country and had a better life here than going back to Germany. There were, there were approximately 5,500 Brunswick troops with about 30,000 Hessian troops, like Hess Hanau, Hess Castle. And so, yeah, about 35,000, uh, which is a, a formidable force to be here with about 50,000 Brits. That was, a, that was a considerable force from uh, until the end of the war. Did all the soldiers have a headpiece like yours, or are you... Uh, Only the uh, grenadiers. The grenadiers would have been, if you look at, like, um, they're referred to as, like, uh, like the equivalent of a modern-day shock, shock troops. So they would have taken the bigger, most experienced, uh, what they call line troops, and put them into these... Uh, uh, these units called grenadiers. Um, if you'll notice the hat, people say, "Well, wouldn't that wouldn't that kind of point you out? Wouldn't people see that?" Well, that's what they want. It was to strike fear. Um, you'll notice that maybe the uh, the the regimental is cut shorter 
than the actual length, uh, what we would consider today, you know, that would be too short, but they wanted to give the illusion that the men were actually growing out of their uniforms, they were so big. So you have that, uh, the height of the, of the headpiece, the miter cap, um, and this would not have been prototypical. I would have had a mustache, but because I do other things like pirate, and this would have actually been cut a little bit back and then turned up. And uh, basically to, to, to give the impression of like the wild boar that they had. And so you really looked fierce. Um, the other thing too that the Americans didn't experience uh, and really didn't know how to, 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 to deal with it was the bayonet. So any of your, you know, your, your, your troops in European warfare, your professional soldier would have, would have known how to use bayonet. But the Americans, once this went on, usually the Americans would turn tail and, and run. And again, you can't blame them. You know, I don't think it was until uh, von Steuben got here and, uh, and really showed, showed the Americans how to, how to, um, uh, to drill, how to use the bayonet. Uh, and really how to fight uh, like a European style of war, but also adopting the tactics they had here, which was kind of like your mini skirmishes, hit and run. And actually it was a war of attrition because, you know, uh, most, most uh, uh, even at the beginning of the war, most uh, uh, Europeans, uh, in Englishmen, uh, you know, let, let the colonies go. Let them just be, be trading partners instead of having this, this rivalry. Um, so could the, I mean, if, if you really played this out to, to, to what could have been more, more years of warfare, could the English have won? Probably. But we'll never know that. Each ducal or principality had their own, um, like Duke Carl of Brunswick. He would have had his own deal made with, with, with King George. One of the things that was nice that, I don't know, I, I can't tell you if all um, of, the, of the Dukes had the same thing, if all Hessians were Brunswick. I know for us, for every man who did not return to Germany, they paid X amount more money. So for every man lost. So did that mean killed in action or simply missing in action? Um, so and so goes and runs off and decides, I'm like, ah, oh, he's killed, you know? And, and they would get more money for every man who did not return. So, yeah, I can't remember how many toddlers it was. Um, but one thing that's interesting, even in captivity, um, the, the Germans were paid, and w which was important anyway when they were fighting me because they did not want them to, uh, to basically go to the other side or desert. Huh. So you made sure they got paid. Huh. Uh, Frank McGinty, and uh, actually my mom still lives in Bennington. I, I've been here for a number of years. My wife Julie and I have just moved over the line into Hoosick. But we're local, we're, we're from here, and I've been doing uh, American Revoir War reenacting since 1994. Um, I, uh, again, people uh, as individuals did here today ask why am I doing German as opposed to anything else. And um, shamefully, I have to say, because when I first saw uh, the gentleman who became our sergeant, Willie Runk, uh, many, many years ago, I just thought, man, that, that's impressive. The, the drill, the precision, that, that um, stereotypical German precision, the language, it just it got me hooked. Um, we, uh, what I did realize was that we had to hand sew all of our uniforms, which took about another 9 to 11 months, so we couldn't even uh, take the field, as they call it, until we were, we were ready to go. But all of the stuff that you see is, um, is, is handmade, all of these uniforms. Um, this uh, musket, which is actually a 1754 um, land pattern musket, it's, um, it, not, it probably would have been prototypical for the Germans. They, they would have had something called a Potsdam, which is a bigger musket, it's, it's, it's heftier. Um, but uh, this accepts a 75 uh, caliber, caliber ball, which uh, will put a big hole in anybody as it comes out the other side of the body. Um, and yeah, like I say, so I'm here to support uh, the other individuals who are here to try to bring a little bit of the history of, of that time period and Bennington specific uh, to the uh, people uh, who are coming to enjoy. And it's, it's not a bad day. And when you're wearing wool, it's just nice to have a cool, breezy day like this. One of the things I like to tell people is that um, we, we were not 
Well, we might have been considered mercenary troops, but to me the definition of a mercenary is a, is a paid professional soldier, one who makes his or her own individual contract to go fight a war or a battle for some, someone else. Um, we, we had to go where we were told to go, whether it be here, stay in Germany, or in any other place in Europe, we got paid the same amount. So I would prefer that we be called auxiliary troops, auxiliary units. I think that's more accurate, especially to the time period. Um, if I went out and contracted for, for my, my, my own wealth, um, my own benefit, fine, call me a mercenary. But when you are with a professional uh, army and you're being told you're going here, there, and everywhere, then, then you're an auxiliary, an auxiliary unit, auxiliary troops. And then after it goes off, I step up. Okay, and the second it goes off, you step up. Um, automatic, automatically go to the vent. Okay. And there's we, uh, we'll go live? through one. I live in uh, Arlington. Yeah. 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 And then. What? People off the walkway. The rifle frock was very much a fatigue uniform. It material was very short. It was there was a material shortage in the American in the American cause up until about 78, 79. So you didn't start seeing a lot of the regimental coats. So what they would do is they'd wear hunting shirts, which are very similar to this, except they don't open in the front. You'd see hunting frocks, which is what this is, um, work shirts, which are made of canvas, um, all sorts of different things to help keep the small clothes, which is the waistcoat, the, the knee breeches, and your shirt, to help keep them clean. So for over 240 years, Vermonters have been celebrating the victory at the Battle of Bennington, one of the turning points of the revolution. Many of us know the story. At a moment when it looked as though the British were going to pull off a victory in this battle, Seth Warner's Green Mountain Regiment arrived from Manchester ready to fight. The victory at the Battle of Bennington caused the British General Burgoyne to delay going to Albany, allowing patriots to gather in numbers and in strength, leading to a victory at the Battle of Saratoga. This monument was not sited where the battle took place, but rather where a storehouse stood with valuable supplies for the Continental Army. Its location is also one of the most historic corners of America a place where colonists were full of ideas about representative democracy, where the Declaration of Independence was shared and discussed, in short, where a spirit of independence was cultivated and advanced. Of course, the revolution was far from a series of victories. It also produced great hardship and sorrow, as it was a time of great division. Tory versus Patriots, neighbor versus neighbor, and even in the case of my maternal ancestors, family member versus family member. But in the end, a great nation arose on principles that we hold dear. I want to thank everyone for joining us here today for today's celebration, as well, in particular, those who protect our nation, our town, teach our children and countless numbers of everyday volunteers who play a part in caring for our community. I of course want to give special thanks to Mary Lou Chicote and her team that keeps our incredible stewards of this space, particularly also Charles Dewey, a local resident who cares for so much of the history in Bennington. Finally, I want to recognize two other people, neither of whom can be here today. One is absent, and the other we lost, sadly, to, to cancer earlier this year. I briefly want to thank Major General David Bernier, who for over 10 years brought the 25th Continental Regiment of 18th century reenactors to the monument. I want to give a very special 
heartfelt thank you to Jim Harrington. Jim passed away this year, and I had the honor of getting to know Jim and his family through their involvement in our community and through their local business. Jim was a lover of the monument, a lover of Bennington, a lover of history. When you walked into his dry cleaning shop that he shares with his wife, there was, as there is inside the monument, relics, old pieces of ceramic, plates, historic memorabilia to share with all. We thank Jim for everything he's done for this community, but in particular for his love and his dedication of this monument. So thank you, Jim. Well, good afternoon. My name is Mike Case. We are the Moonest Drummond Fife Corps. This is our second year in a row being here at the monument, but it is our third appearance here because the Corps was here at the 1891 dedication of this monument. And we were, we were asked back last year and again this year. You want to go ahead with the firing of the cannon before I do my uh, spiel? So today we are here under the uh, direction of our drum major, Charlie Woodward. Our drum sergeant is Amy Armstrong, and our fife sergeant, Terry Anderson Murray. We're going to be doing, uh, we'll be here for two hours. We're going to do 20 minute sets with uh, 10 minute breaks between sets because these are wool uniforms and it's hot and muggy. Some of the tunes we're going to be playing here would have been very familiar to the men who fought here. They are, a lot of them are Revolutionary War or earlier vintage. Others are early 19th century tunes. Our instruments are also uh, early 19th century. First piece we're going to play is titled 1812. I guess they're firing it again. It's actually older than that. It was a Revolutionary War uh, tune. It was originally titled Welcome Home Again. And a little bit of trivia, it is the theme song to one of my favorite early Clint Eastwood movies, The Outlaw Josie Wales. Although they play it way too fast in that movie. 
So, 1812. As I said, we were here in 18, uh, 1891 at the dedication of this monument. There was a parade at that time. We will also be marching in the parade tomorrow. You may notice our bass drum has the date 1860 on it. That is the date that this core was incorporated and we have been in continuous uh, operation since then. The core is actually much older than that. In 1821, the local Buddhist gentleman named Hezekiah Percival obtained a certificate in ancient drumming from Samuel Wilcox in Middletown. He went home to Buddhist and he taught his brother and some of the other local gentlemen how to play in the style he had learned. And perfected and then they started playing at local uh, events gatherings parades eventually fives were added uh, both Orville and Hezekiah Percival made fives themselves throughout the years the Corps has favored different styles of fifes uh, at one point we have pictures of the Corps playing fifes that appear to be made by Coos in Brooklyn New York uh, in the late 1800s Buell fives became popular, which were made right locally in, uh, in Buddhist. In the 1950s, Ed Ferrari from uh, Essex, Connecticut, right at the mouth of the Connecticut River, started producing fives. And a lot of the core members uh, favor the Ferrari fives. They're very high quality. And as early, as late as uh, about 15 years ago, one of our former members, Ron Pillar, started making fives in the particular Buddhist style. 
Uh, so some of the drums are original, others are a little bit older, or a little bit newer, but uh, I don't think there's any drum on the field here that's uh, 20th century manufactured, or 21st century manufactured. Yeah. The next tune we're going to be playing is titled Yankee Boy. It was a World War I song, and if you're a uh, Jimmy Cagney fan, you know the, uh, the movie Yankee Doodle Dandy, this is the song that uh, he sang in that movie. As mentioned before, in 1891, when the monument was dedicated, President Benjamin Harrison was here. That was not the first time the British German Five Corps had played for a president. We also played at the dedication of the Washington Monument in 1885. President Chester Arthur at that time saw us play at the dedication to the monument and invited the Corps to the White House. And in the case of, be careful what you ask for, Mr. President, the drums cracked the plaster in the ceiling of the East Room. Next tune that the core is going to play is a black watch. Uh, the core will play for you is a tune that would have been very familiar to the men who fought here. It is a revolutionary war uh, tune. Uh, it is very popular among every uh, Fife and Drum Corps. 
we play a longer version of it. And interestingly enough, when this is played, the drums and the fifes are actually playing different tunes. The drums will be playing Connecticut Halftime, and the fifers play a tune called Rosalie Road to Boston. Have you ever seen that show Turn about the, the that's a, that's pretty close to what Simco about the Rangers and what they did. It's a good it's about ninety four percent accurate. It's a little not, but, but it's pretty close, wouldn't you say? The Green Rangers became more effective around seventeen seventy eight and then down in the Philadelphia campaign in that area where they became quite well known for what they did. They were known for night raids and they did thing and Kind of special services. Well, let's say that special <laughs> unit, right? They could have been considered. But they were. They were. They, they, they didn't like what was going on. I guess it, it was a personal thing. I think down oh. the Prince Rangers. It wasn't with the, uh, the German forces. They were. I we had to come. They had to come because they were. They were because wasn't their relationship to the Queen, the King, and, 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 the, and the leader of Germany at the time? Yeah. When he was talking about neighbor against neighbor. Uh, it, it was That's, the first civil war. Yeah. People think the war between states is it. Was it was the Revolutionary War was the first war uh, because. You see, everybody sees they see blue coats and they see red coats. And, ah, that's the way this war. It's only a part of it. That was just there were, there were very few major battles with that kind of a clientele, if you call it. But the loyalists and the patriots, they were. And it's smaller and more maneuverable, more like a fencing sword, so that you can that he can get in under my guard if I have one of these and stick me. You have to remember how the fighting with the claymore in the 18th century was a two-handed operation. You had the dirk in one hand, and you had the claymore in the other. You had the basket hilt in the other. They made entire charges like this, in nothing but a and nothing but a kilt and these weapons. That's it.
some of you are surprised. Did you think a woman would never run for president? <laughs> <laughs> or that a black man would run for one of the highest offices in the land? Frederick Douglass has been chosen as my running mate. <laughs> I better let him know soon. <laughs> but you see, I have never let established notions of respectability or womanly self-effacement stop me. I have too many things I want to do and say. I don't worry about getting my name in the papers. After all, a reputation is only skin deep. I have learned that notorious goes alone. <laughs> well, no matter. <laughs> you can't miss what you never had. The only reputation my family ever had originated with my father, Buck Claflin. And it wasn't good. Salvation of the human race. She invented medicinal compound defective in every case. <laughs> When you have a drinking song written about you, you are definitely notorious. <laughs> well, Mrs. Pinkham died in 1884. The letters continued to come in and continued to be answered. The fact that she was dead didn't stop the advertisers from saying, writers, write to Mrs. Pinkham. The company kept Mrs. Pinkham alive for years. <laughs> Finally, the Ladies Home Journal exposed the fiction in 1905 by printing a picture of Lydia's grave. <laughs> in my mind, women's rights begins in the bedroom, not in the voting booth. All talk of women's rights is moonshine. Women have every right. They have only to exercise them. I say to women, instead of waiting for the vote, take charge of your lives and do as what you wish. Then we were in Pittsburgh, Colonel Blood and I, when another vision came to me. I saw the word Demosthenes, and it gave me an address in New York City where it assured me there was an apartment clean, open, and ready for us to move in immediately. Oh, of course, he had to follow it. <laughs> so we invited Teddy to come along with us and join in the fight for women's rights. Mother, father, my <laughs> sisters, their husbands and children, Dr. Woodhull, and my sister Utica all invited themselves. <laughs> we crammed into an apartment on 28 Great Jones Street in the heart of the city. The father immediately advertised his daughters as healers, and one day, a very, very rich elderly gentleman came to us for spiritual advice as a physician. Cornelius Vanderbilt. <laughs> the Commodore was 73, older than our father. But although he had made a fortune in shipping and railways, he always dressed simply in a black coat, black cravat, he enjoyed smoking black cigars and a glass of beer. He had the arrogance of a king, of a king and the language of a sailor. <laughs> well, the Commodore was feeling down on his luck when he met us. He'd recently lost his wife, but more troubling, he just lost $7 million losing control of the Erie Railroad to Wall Street speculators. We, particularly Teddy, for just what he needed. <laughs> Tenny, just likely to forget. <laughs> Her mother Charlotte was said to be a cursing, smoking, bawdy woman. And her father's family said that Robert found his wife in a bawdy house. Well, after taking the children to Montana gold seeking, Helene found herself orphaned at the age of 11. Considering following her mother as a laundress was not an appealing choice. For her, foul 
following Union Pacific Railroad work camps and Union troops was much more to her liking, which included a taste for liquor, <laughs> being able to wander around freely, dress in male attire, and dance in saloons for money. Do I need to elaborate? <laughs> it worked for her. Buffalo Bill Cody recalls meeting her in the Bighorn Mountains as kind of a hanger-on with scouting parties and U.S. troops. But nobody knows for sure how Calamity got her name. There's Buffalo Bill Cody. There's Calamity. She claims she got the name when she rescued a wounded federal officer, after which he pronounced her good to have around in a calamity. <laughs> her card-playing friends said that whenever she lost, she'd holler, what a calamity! <laughs> Other less generous people said the uh, name came from the unfortunate physical ailment her many lovers acquired from her. <laughs> No matter. We go on. The worst injustice of all time is the exercise of assumed powers. This is the essence of tyranny. Well, those of you won't believe the end of Tenny's and my stories, but it's true. Have I ever told you anything but the truth? <laughs> in England, Tenny and I both fell in love. I to Sir John Biddulph Martin and Tenny to Viscount Francis Cook, British nobleman. They love us just the way we are and hold many of the same views we hold. Here is where John and I live, Overbury Court in Worcestershire, England. And Teddy and Lord Cook have two homes, Dobby House in Richmond Hill, London, and the Montserrat Palace in Portugal. <laughs> And by the way, a mother just moved in with Tenny and Lord Cook. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, chicken and the ham would be beans, of course. We've always uh, uh, Leo's uh, wife, excellent cook, and she used to put on some scrumptious meals. I'm trying to think of some of the names of them. What are you talking about? The stuff Kathleen makes? Yeah. yeah. Oh, you got cobs of beef, cranberry pot roast is my yeah, favorite. Um, sausage, peppers, and onion. Pumpkin soup. Pumpkin soup. Pizza soup. Blueberry uh, pot. Yeah. Apple apple pork. Yep. Two berry pie. That was the one we had to debate whether you and Clay were going to try and kill each other over. You know if I'm still here. Part of a militiaman from Vermont, of which there were over 500 of them here originally for the battle. And um, just talked to the public, told them about the uniform and the accoutrements and the, the weapon that I have and so forth. And where do you come from at the time? I come from Reedsboro, Vermont. And you do a lot of these men? Well, when I was young, I did a tremendous number, and now I've um, cut back in my old age a little bit, so I'm not doing anywhere near as much. But. Thank you.
Wait till they let you carry the musket. Oh my gosh. Look at that. Is it hot? 42 bucks yes, or something hot. like that. Yes, it's hot. very heavy. You must be Feel Molly Stark. Yes. Molly Stark. Yes. Oh my goodness. Supposedly they're water resistant. Oh, and then it gets heavier and beautiful. heavier and heavier and heavier. Have you weighed it? All my gear, including the jacket, is 35 pounds. This is five. Or, uh, dry. We are Nelson Pam Erickson. We're from Shrewsbury. We started reenacting about 22 years ago. Joined General Dave Bernier, 25th Massachusetts Regiment, and been with them ever since. So I do a lot of the musket demonstrations, and my wife worked, used to work over the fires with the women and do all the cooking and so forth. They pitched their own tent, we did this. For about five or six years, we were furriers. We had pups and all the animals that were around. And sometimes we'd stand in front of our tent and the pups were all hanging up. And you'd see women take their kids and they'd go all the way around the tent. They didn't want to get close to us. So we get uh, youngsters there and take a little girl and take a fox pelt and wrap it around their neck. And they would take off and they would have it in the greatest time. Or they so, pet them. And your cover over We have a wolf pet. We have a wolf yes, pelt that has almost all the fur in certain places because the children so petted it. Quit. So, yeah. This is all weather, all weather gear here. Yeah. What's the story of this coat? It's actually French and Indian war era. The great coat is called. For a great person. Yeah, for great people. And yeah. his wife made it. No, he didn't. No, she didn't. This was made by Flying Canoe out of Canada. Oh, really? But his wife made these. Yeah. Now they're she 20 years this. old. She yeah. yeah. Made all the small clothes I'm wearing. Made all of my, my regimental coat and all that stuff. She got ill. So that's where we're at. So we used to pitch a tent, now we have a little trail we take. It got a little bit too. Say, Leo. We were getting too old to sleep on the ground. We miss that part of it. Really. We do. That's us.